The second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John. It is the 17th chapter, verses 20 through 26. It is John's take on the unity of the church. So hear now the good news. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. May God aid us in our interpretation and especially in our ability to live according to it. If you want a shorthand version of what that was all about, Jesus said to his disciples, you are one in me because I'm one in God. And then to God, I want these people to have the same kind of relationship with me, with you, as they do with me. A lot of these and thems, but that's what it comes down to. I talked a lot today well, all week, about what to call this sermon. Um, I'm going to talk about how we use the word but a lot. So I started out with the title, Big Butts. I thought that might be a little bit disconcerting for some. So then I went to um, Jesus and us as one, and the idea being unity. And we have unity through all three persons of God, who is God in one. And so that's where I ended up, with the word unity, which you see there. The reading from the Gospel of John reminds us that Christ has made us one with all parts of the Trinity, just as Jesus himself is to God. Without Jesus making us part of the entire trinity, we would still be just followers seeking the full God. But because Jesus did that, we are one with the Father and the Creator and Jesus the Son. It's a call to be in relationship with all that God is, and it's a call to be in relationship with one another in God Christ Spirit, and it, it is a way of being that um, makes us part of the family of God even when we're not sitting here in the pew. A lot of people look at church as you're only a Christian when you come to church, but God's view of those who follow him and the Christianity um, movement as it started out as is that all people are open to the love of God. And then there's that little passage about judge not lest ye be judged, so we don't get to say who's included and who's not. God says all people are included. We may not like the behavior of some, but that doesn't disqualify them from God's love. Even some of the worst criminals in the world, God still loves them and wants better for them. And if you're like me, it's hard not to judge. And sometimes I do, and then I have to ask for forgiveness because it's much easier to judge than it is to try to understand and move to where God wants me to be. 
In March 1984, there was a malfunction at the Pacific Gas and Electric Company in Northern California. It triggered a chain reaction that darkened the lights for millions of people in six states. One electric company took out six states. The blackout occurred at rush hour, of course, which caused hundreds of traffic jams in all the major cities. None of the traffic lights were working. The trouble they found originated in Round Mountain, California, a substation there, about 100 miles south of the Oregon border. A circuit breaker tripped and circuits all over the West automatically shut down to protect themselves. Now what does this have to do with Christian unity? One little circuit breaker tripped in a remote area where you wouldn't think it could do much harm at all and hundreds of miles away changed how people were living because of the loss of their power. And it wasn't just five minutes, it was a long outage. That symbolizes the interdependence that our country's power, or maybe I should say that we have with our country's power. What affects one can affect all. And the unity of the church is no different. The good one person does make the task easier for us all. And on the other hand, one bad example can set back the entire church. God's people, wherever they live on earth, are linked into a grid of community interdependence, just like the electric grid, from which we can never escape because we are Christians because we believe in the one true God. The more we are one, the more we will be effective in the world. And as church, the more that we are one, the more effective we will be as church. Notice I didn't say anything about how big a church was or how rich a church was. It's simply God's people joined together one by one can make a difference in the world. Here come the buts. Likewise, the more buts get in the way of an authentic relationship with God, the more offline from the grid the church is. Just like the wider community, everyone has big buts. But it's the only day I have to sleep in. But I have to mow the grass, it's been raining forever. But it's family day, but it's boring, but the game is on. And other big buts, the kids have sports. I'm not in the mood. I deserve a break today. It's a beautiful day and I want to get outside. And I bet that was a temptation for a lot of folks today. I just want to veg in front of the TV on the sofa eating junk food. Now, of course, there's a lot of other buts that you all can add from your own experience. But what doesn't grow when all these buts get into play is the strength of our relationship with God. Because when we choose to do those things instead of be present to God, then we have weakened it for the entire church. The ugliest thing about all these buts is that we can't participate in what God calls us to. Verse 23 says, I and them and you and me, that they may become completely one. Do you ever think about church like that? One with each other, completely together. Now, there's some ugly butts that get in the way, but they don't look like me, but they don't believe like I do. Can we only be with those who are like us? But I don't like them. But it's too hard. But it's so time consuming. But it's also confusing. So many buts that come to mind. Salier, an old man, described for a priest his reaction years earlier upon examining the score of an oboe concerto by Mozart. It made no sense to him when he was just listening to it. But then he looked at it and he understood that the oboe part was way above the clarinet part, and the clarinet was taking over, and he was awed by that brilliance. 
All the parts constituted a stunning whole that deeply impacted the man before it was ever even played. That's a scene from the movie Amadeus. God has so arranged individuals in the body of Christ so that they constitute a oneness that impacts the world. We don't get to say where we are in God's plan. We simply are. And God helps us understand what it is we are to be doing. The first one is to be kind, to recognize others as God's, to be open as Christ wanted them to be, wanted us to be. When the why we worship God is so small compared to the buts of why we don't worship God, think about that for a minute, the unity of all gets trashed. Christ gets left out of the equation. And the way to get it back together so that our authentic life with God requires that we be present and step up to our part, the way we do that is to shrink all those butts, get them out of our lives as much as, pow as possible. Prayer, scripture, worship, and service. That's the four parts of living out our faith, our relationship with God, Christ, Spirit. It's that to which we are secured that we will enable ourselves, empower ourselves to get rid of some of those buts. Now, hear me clearly. I am not saying you don't ever come to church. I am not saying you don't ever skip an opportunity to come and work on work day. I'm not even saying that every now and then you can't pray because of what's going on in your life. What I am saying is that at the center of who we are, our priority is our God in Christ, creator, and spirit. When we are secured there, then we are able to be in unity. During a frightful storm in the Georgian Bay of Canada years ago, a ship was wrecked. Many perished. The mate was six strong men and one timid girl escaped in a boat. But the waves were high and the craft turned over and over until one by one the strong men lost their hold and disappeared beneath the angry billows. The maid, however, had lashed the girl to the boat, and thus she drifted to the shore where she was found safe and unharmed. Those men went down with shrieks of despair, and she alone was saved because somebody thought to fasten her to safety. Now the boat could have turned upside down, and she stayed that way, and she could have drowned, all sorts of things could have happened, but it didn't. And she got safely to shore. And she was fastened firmly to that which would not sink. What that has to do with us is that in the house of worship, you get to know many Christians. In some of the outreach that you do, you get to know other Christians. You also get to know people who aren't Christians. And in your daily lives, that's especially true. But if you're opening, open to seeing what God has in store, that's where that unity holds you secure. Any fisherman can tell you it's not the weight that makes the line sink under the water. But for us, it is the buts, the excuses, the running away from God that we do that sinks us down. Garrison Keillor, one of my favorite uh, NPR persons, author, said this, To know and to serve God, of course, is why we're here. A clear truth that, like the nose on your face, is near at hand and easily discernible, but can make you dizzy if you try to focus on it hard. But a little faith will see you through. What else would do except faith in such a cynical, corrupt time? When the country goes temporarily to the dogs, cats must learn to be circumspect, walk on fences, sleep in trees, and have faith that all this woofing is not the last word. Sounds like today, but this was written in 2013. 
What is the last word then? Gentleness is everywhere in daily life, a sign that faith rules ordinary things when you see people being kind to one another. Gentleness also shows up in cooking and small talk and storytelling, making love and fishing, tending animals and sweet corn and flowers, through sports, music and books, raising kids, all the places where the gravy soaks in and grace shines through. The church and the gospel it proclaims are never some local phenomenon. It is worldwide. Despite our denominational fractures and the lack of formal unity we may have across the face of the church today, the fact is that in every hamlet where a tiny congregation gathers in the name of the risen Christ, in every soaring cathedral, wherever that might be, where hundreds gather, in every mega church that packs people by the thousands, and in every house church in nations where official church gatherings are banned. In and through all of that, in and through our world, is the unity that we have. The mystery that is God dates back to well before the creation of the world, and it continues on and on into the future. And at some point, this same God is going to say, Behold, I make all things new. The unity of the church prepares us for that day. The unity of the church is what keeps a congregation going under the realization that you are not the end all to be all. That as wonderful as this church is, there are other congregations who are doing mighty works too. And it has nothing to do with your size or the number of people who come to worship or who don't come. It has to do with the heart of those who are in union with God and with one another. The church isn't mostly about bake sales and vacation Bible schools and senior citizen bus trips and silly committee meetings. Unity in Christ is a relational intention that you have with one another. I will be gone at the end of June. Your relationship will continue. Trish will move on to a new position at the end of June and you will still be the church in union with Christ and in union with one another. When your new pastor comes, it will be a new relationship and it is the unity of who you are as church that will help her assimilate into the congregation to become a part of this group where eventually you won't be calling her the new pastor, you'll simply be calling her our pastor. That's what unity is all about. No ifs, ands, or buts. To God be the glory. Amen.